And here we go with our video for 17.1, The Flow of Energy. Now, so far this year, we've studied different properties of matter, and we haven't really done much with energy, but now we are going to. So the first word we have to think about is thermochemistry. And thermo comes from the Greek, and it's from thermos, which means heat. And chemistry, the study of matter, but we're here looking at how heat plays a part in chemistry. So thermochemistry is the study of energy changes during chemical reactions. Now, every single substance has energy stored inside of it, and that energy is referred to as chemical potential energy. And it's stored in the chemical bond. So if we think of you know, our classic water molecule, right, oxygen connected to do hydrogens, and that bond that joins the oxygen and the hydrogen the oxygen and the hydrogen together, there's stored energy. Now to break that bond, we have required to break these chemical bonds. But when chemical bonds are formed, energy is released. Now, depending on how much energy <clears throat> is necessary to break the bond and how much energy is released when it's formed, that determines the overall amount of heat of a reaction, whether it's going to absorb heat or whether overall it's going to release heat. <clears throat> and that leads to exothermic and endothermic processes. Now, in any chemical reaction, energy is both absorbed and released, right? So energy is absorbed in breaking bonds, and it's released when bonds are formed. So if more energy is absorbed than is released, then the reaction is endothermic. And endo is derived from the Greek endon, which means within. And thermic, once again, comes from the thermos, which means heat or hot. So within hot means it's absorbed energy into the substance. If more energy is released than absorbed, then the reaction is exothermic. And the prefix here, exo, means outside. So endo is in, exo is out. So exothermic means heat is released outward okay now an example of an endothermic reaction right if you think of the uh, chemical ice packs right a little plastic bag you kind of smush it up a little bit and it starts to get cold well it feels cold to you because it's absorbing heat energy out of your hand so an example of that would be an ice pack and an example of an exothermic reaction would be pretty much anything with fire so if you're starting to, if you memorize, or you at least remember that exo, that a candle is exothermic, right, and it feels hot to touch, then you'll remember that exothermic reactions are going to give off heat and they're going to feel hot. Endothermic reactions are going to absorb heat and they feel cold. Okay, so heat flow and heat capacity. The way I like to think of it, and if you remember back to biology, right? remember diffusion, things diffuse from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Well, heat kind of does the same thing. If you think of a warm object as being a high concentration of heat and a cold object being a low concentration of heat, well, the heat flows from the warmer object, high concentration, right? high concentration to colder objects which have a low concentration just like you learned in biology when you learned about diffusion. Now the unit of measurement that we use for heat and chemistry is the joule. Now classically like right last year in biology and in health class you've learned about calories which calories, which is also a unit of heat. And the calorie, what I liked about that, I wish they still used it, the calorie will 
take one gram, if you take one gram of water and add one calorie of heat, it will raise the temperature of that one gram of water one degree Celsius. So one, one, one. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. So easy to always remember. But the joule is what we have to use now. And it's a little bit different. One joule raises one gram of water 0 0.2390 degrees Celsius. Right, unfortunately, it's just the way it is. We have to memorize. We don't, we don't have to memorize it because it's on the reference table. So at least that kind of works for us. Now, with food, just in case calories come up again, when you see calorie labels on food packaging, they are kilo calories in food. So when something says it has 20 calories on food, that's really 20 kilo or 20,000 calories. All right, so now heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of an object one degree Celsius. So it deals with how much heat something can hold, how much energy it takes to heat something up. And that depends on the object's chemical composition and mass. And this is something that you've come across many times in your life, but maybe you haven't really thought about it. If you are boiling water or cooking something that's boiling and you're going to stir it, do you prefer a metal-handled spoon or a wooden-handled spoon? Especially if you're going to kind of leave it in the hot liquid, right? Metal-handed spoon, you leave it in the pot, you walk away, you come back, and you go to stir it, and you burn your hand. A wooden spoon, you don't, because the metal spoon transmits the heat very, very quickly. It heats up very, very quickly because it actually has a fairly low heat capacity. And heat capacity is related to specific heat. Another vocabulary term. The amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of an object one degree Celsius. So with the heat capacity, it's just to raise the temperature of any object, no matter what its size is. The specific heat specifically deals with one gram of that object. So this, since it's always dealing with one gram, it's not dependent on mass. It depends only on the object's chemical composition. So here's an example of heat flow. And this device here is a calorimeter. It's uh, insulated, so it's not going to let heat in or out, and we can measure the temperature of whatever's inside. So we're going to have it here filled with just a small amount of water. So let's say 200 grams of water, and we're going to lower the temperature down to 20 degrees Celsius. So now we have 200 grams of water at 20 degrees Celsius. And we're going to see what happens if we add a piece of copper to it. So let's say we do a 200 gram piece of copper. And we'll say this copper is nice and hot at 100 degrees Celsius. And we're going to look at a graph of what it's going to look like here. All right, so let's watch. We're going to add the copper. So when we add the copper, and right, we can see here the water heats up a little bit from the heat in the copper, and the copper really cools down a lot until they match in temperature. So the heat flew, or there was heat flow from the copper to the water. And you can see that same amount of copper and water mass-wise, but the water only heated up a little bit while the copper cooled down a lot. All right, so let's see what happens now if we do something other than copper. Let's say we add granite. We'll do the same thing, 20 grams of granite, 20 grams of granite. and we'll start it at 100 degrees Celsius. And similarly, right here the water heated up even less and the granite cooled down really quickly. Right, so the heat flow goes from the warmer object to the cooler. Okay, now this brings us to a new important formula, 
which is Q equals MC delta T. And this is what we're going to be working on in class tomorrow. So let's take a look at the formula. Q is going to be the symbol for heat. And it's measured in joules. And I'll remind you again and again, because it is important, it's a lowercase q, right? Because you're going to learn, if you take physics next year, you're going to learn a capital Q is related to charge. All right? So it's not a capital Q, it's a lowercase q. And it's measured in joules. Lowercase m is mass, right? Not a capital M. Do you remember what that is? If you said molarity, you remember it correctly. All right, so lowercase m is mass, and the unit for that is the gram. Now, what we just learned about on the previous slide, something that's new to us as well, is specific heat, and that's a capital C. Right, lowercase c is actually related to the speed of light. If you ever take physics and you do equals mc squared, you'll deal with that then. So it's not a lowercase c, it is a capital C. Okay, And the unit is joules divided by grams times degrees Celsius. Or you could also say joules divided by grams times kelvins because here we're just talking about how much the temperature actually changes. So with this formula, when we deal with our temperature, we can use either kelvins or degrees Celsius. And here's just a list of some specific heats you don't have to write these all down it's just so you can see and amongst all of these objects the highest specific heat is water water actually has a very high specific heat relative to many many other substances it takes a lot of energy to heat up water and finally temperature is T and the unit is degrees Celsius, or we could use Kelvins, and it's a capital T, a lowercase t is going to be time in other things, especially next year in physics. Finally, change in temperature. That delta, it's not a triangle, it's the Greek letter delta in front of the T, means change in temperature. And we get that by doing, so delta T, change in temperature, is going to be the final temperature, T with a little f minus the initial temperature. And it's always final temperature minus initial. And we'll get more into that uh, when we do an example and we do some practice problems in class. And as well, the unit of this is degrees Celsius or Kelvins. In this case, since it's a change in temperature, they can be used interchangeably. All right. So one more little look here at the specific heat, something important to realize. The higher the specific heat, the slower something heats up, the more energy it takes to heat it up. All right, this going to be, that's going to be important to remember for something we're going to be doing in class starting tomorrow. The lower the specific heat, the faster something heats up, the less heat energy it takes to raise the temperature. All right, so let's do an example problem here. How much heat is required to raise the temperature of 100 grams of water from 20 degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius? Okay, so first thing we're always going to do, right, that we're used to by now, first thing we do is write the formula, Q equals MC delta T. All right, so let's say Q is equal to M equals C equals delta T equals, and delta T is equal to the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Okay? All right. So, Q, how much heat, so that's what we're going to be looking for, how many joules of heat, M, the 100 grams of water, you know, let's say 100 point grams, that's right. We have some sig figs there. It'll say 20 point degrees Celsius and 70 point degrees Celsius. All right. So our mass is 100 grams. Now C, that's on your reference table, and 4.18 joules 
per gram times degrees Celsius. Our final temperatures are 70 degrees Celsius, so 70 minus 20. So our delta T is equal to 50 degrees Celsius. All right, so we're solving for Q, so we don't need to do any algebra here. I promise you'll be doing that in class tomorrow. But here we don't. All right, so mass is 100 grams or C, 4.18 joules, and I'm going to put it over grams degrees Celsius, you'll see why in a moment, times our delta T, which is 50 degrees Celsius. All right, as always, our next step, cancel out units, so we get rid of grams, get rid of degrees Celsius, and we're left with only joules, which works because Q is heat energy, and it's measured in joules, just like we wrote here. All right, so now I'm ready to plug these into my handy-dandy calculator. And I have 100 times 4.18 times 50 is equal to 20,900 joules. All right, so really I should have only two significant figures. So to do this to a correct number of significant figures, it would be 21,000 zero, zero, zero joules or 21,000 joules. All right, that was our example. As always, I recommend rewinding and going back over things if there's something you need to hear again. And I strongly recommend doing this example on your own without looking at this. Kind of rewind it a little bit before you see all my writing and try doing this problem on your own to see how well you do. And you should do really well because the methodology is the same as we've been doing for quite some time. Alrighty, that brings us to the end. I'll see you guys in school.